Thank you so much. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here at a and I teach in South Texas, so not too far away. Uh, our topic today is the current Supreme Court term. This term is going to be pretty big, so I want to do a few things. I want to talk a little bit about last year's term, then highlight some of the cases this year, <coughs> excuse me. and then we'll drill down to three cases that, <coughs> sorry, I thought this cold that refuses to go away. Not Corona, I promise. <laughs> And then we'll drill down some cases for this year. Last year was significant. <coughs> it was the first full term for Justice Brett Kavanaugh. Justice Kavanaugh had a rough start to his tenure, putting it mildly. <coughs> he was confirmed in a very narrow vote, and he has a lot of, oh boy. <coughs> Excuse me. I'll make this work, I promise. Is there a mic? That might be easier. Is there a microphone? Sorry, never happened before. <coughs> okay, let's try this. <coughs> Sorry. Actually, you know what? Do you want to go first, and then I'll 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 pitch in later because this is I need a minute. Yeah. yeah. Sure, Sorry. Yeah. We'll we'll do it like that. Sorry. I'll I'll just say a few open things. Hey, give me a minute to catch my breath. Um. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> my breath. to Josh and I have talked about uh, what uh, he's going to talk about and he is the guest of honor here so I'm going to sort of um, uh, defer to what he wants to talk about but uh, he had identified three cases that were of particular interest to him uh, one was uh, New York pistol and rifle which is about a challenge to a New York City ordinance uh, governing the carrying of weapons handguns from your home to out of state or out of city uh, ranges, uh, homes, and so forth. Um, the second one was Little Sisters of the Poor, probably the greatest plaintiff you could possibly think of. Um, as a litigator, you're always looking for awesome plaintiffs who are very sympathetic. Uh, Little Sisters of the Poor, you can't do much better than that. Uh, which is a challenge to the exemption. Uh, it actually is a challenge by the states to an exemption or accommodation, more specifically, uh, given to nonprofit uh, religious based organizations. Um, and the third one was the DACA case, which uh, challenges um, changes to DACA and, in, by implication, DACA itself. Um, so those were the three that uh, he had identified. I'm going to predict a little bit um, what I think that uh, Professor Blackman really focused on here. And I'm going to base it on, he, he filed briefs in both the DACA case and the um, uh, New York uh, pistol and rifle case. And in both cases, um, uh, sorry, not the New York City pistol, but the, the DACA and the Little Sisters of the Four case. And I'm forecasting what you're saying, Josh, so we'll see how I... Uh, in reading uh, Professor Blackman's uh, brief in this case, uh, what I define is that he is most concerned in those two cases about uh, the non-delegation doctrine. Uh, and what we mean by that is approximately uh, 80 years ago and before, there was a concept in the law uh, that Congress was not constitutionally permitted to delegate its legislative authority to uh, administrative agencies and very closely guarded uh, and doctrine, <coughs> meaning that uh, all, all sorts of delegations were not there. Um, and then about 80 years ago, 
we suddenly shifted and they found, they essentially eliminated the non-delegation doctrine. So that no, no delegation had been struck down for, for nearly 80 years. Um, uh, for, so recently there's been a lot bubbling up, particularly uh, from folks uh, like Cato and like me, yeah, like him, uh, who have seen the opportunity with Kavanaugh's ascension to the court for a five-four majority uh, that would bring back, and I'm actually very anxious to ask him this question: to what extent? Yeah. Um, that would bring back at least some form of the non-delegation doctrine. Um, so, uh, I guess my uh, I will. Leave this out as a question. Let them take the yeah. place. I the think <laughs> I think I can speak now. I was fine all morning the second I started this this congestion. I promise no corona. I promise this has been some <laughs> mucus I've had for weeks. I know it sounds gross, but uh, it happens. We're human. Okay. Uh, thank you again for having me, and I appreciate uh, Sir Holland for for buying me a couple minutes to go vomit in the bath and giving out. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, last term was the first term where Justice Kavanaugh had a full. Uh, a, a period to show his stuff. And we had a preview. Um, Justice Kavanaugh, perhaps unexpectedly, was not controversial in his first term. He was in the majority 91% of the time. Justice Kavanaugh was closer to Justice Breyer and Kagan than he was to Justice Thomas. In fact, the person that Justice Kavanaugh matches the most with, in terms of votes, was the Chief Justice. So at least in his first term, Justice Kavanaugh showed that he was going to be maybe more centrist. I don't know how long that lasts, and Professor Holland teased at perhaps some of the ways that Justice Kavanaugh might pivot to the right. But at least in his first term, Justice Kavanaugh had a bit of a centrist streak. The last term was unique in that the 5-4 decisions weren't all right-left. In fact, Justice Gorsuch joined with the liberals in four cases involving criminal procedure. I think in this regard, Justice Gorsuch is like Justice Scalia, who had a very strong affinity for criminal defendant rights. He also had Chief Justice Roberts join, even Justice Alito joined the four liberals. So even though Kennedy's gone, you saw this, this sense that the court isn't necessarily 100% right-left. But there's no doubt that the court has shifted to the right. I think we've seen that with a few cases granted this year. The first case that I want to talk about involves guns. I think he teased the balls in the bathroom. The case is called New York State Pistol, I'm sorry, New York State Rifle and Pistol Club versus City of New York. The facts of this case are actually fairly mundane. In New York, if you pass a basic background check, you can own a firearm. You get what's called a premise license. Not a carry license, but merely a license to put a gun in your premise, your home. Under the original New York law, you could transport your gun to a shooting range within New York City. You could not transport your gun to a home outside New York City, or even a second home in New York City could not transfer your gun to a shooting competition. Okay. This law was challenged by several New York residents and a, and a gun organization. The district court upheld it. The circuit court upheld it. And then something unexpected happened. The Supreme Court granted review. The Supreme Court had not granted a Second Amendment case in nearly a decade since McDonald v. Chicago in 2010. This was considered a big deal because the Supreme Court had turned away every gun case that had come their way in really 10 years. And this case signaled that the court wanted to rule in the Second Amendment, but chose a fairly, I don't want to say minor, but not a big case, right? This wasn't about the right to have an AR-15 or the right to open carry. This said, can you transport your gun in a lockbox in your trunk to a shooting range in New Jersey, right? The world will not end if you can put your gun in a lockbox and bring it to a shooting range in New Jersey, right? This is not a carrying in a school or in a public place. It's a fairly minor issue. Okay, what happens next? After 
the Supreme Court grants review, the people in New York start to freak out. Okay? They say, uh-oh, the conservative Supreme Court wants to make a ruling on the Second Amendment. We don't want that, right? We are afraid of the Supreme Court ruling on the Second Amendment. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to try to moot the case. Now, you may have studied this in civil procedure other classes. Mootness is a concept in law where if there's no longer a live case or controversy, there's nothing for the courts to do, right? If, if, if everyone agrees that this law doesn't exist anymore, there's no case. So what does New York do? The city repeals the ordinance. They repeal it in its entirety. And they go a step further. The state legislature enacts a statute that forbids the reenactment of that statute. So in other words, New York City doesn't have a law, and by virtue of state law, they can never have that law. They are, this is what we call papering, right? If you're a lawyer, you paper it, right? You, you cover it, you dot your eyes, you cross your teeth, you do everything in your power to kill the case. Okay, then what happens? New York repeals its law, and they go to the court and say, hey, Supreme Court, uh, get rid of this case. It's what's called moot, right? There's nothing left to decide. There's no live case or controversy. Well, there's another argument. The lawyers from New York argue that the case still exists. There's a doctrine in law called voluntary cessation. Voluntary cessation, which is an exception to the movement's doctrine. What does that doctrine say? If you are the government and you get sued, and you say, you know what, we're going to stop doing this, right? We're not going to do it anymore. The court can say, I don't believe you. I don't believe you. So imagine a case where you have a police department that engages in brutality, that, 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 that beats people all the time. And they get sued. And the sheriff goes, you know what, we're going to stop. We're going to be really good cops now. Get rid of this lawsuit. And the judge says, yeah, right. right. You're not going to stop on a dime. So there are some cases where the courts say, we're going to keep this case. We're not going to dismiss it for voluntary cessation grounds. Right? Is this such a case? As much as it pains me, I don't think so. Uh, New York did their homework. Uh, I think they did everything conceivable to uh, repeal this ordinance and make sure it never gets repealed. There might be some plaintiffs who may suffer damages as a consequence of this law having existed. It's not clear to me that there was a request for damages in the complaint. And this is a this is an issue in which I know the parties don't agree. But generally, when you sue the government, you don't really seek damages. You just seek what's called injunctive relief. You want to prohibit the law from being enforced. The government now argues, I'm sorry, the, the federal government now argues that there might be a claim for damages on remand. You can add it later. I, I don't have a strong opinion on this, but I think it probably doesn't, doesn't fly. Um, if I had it my way, which of course I don't, um, I would just dismiss the case outright. Um, but that hasn't happened. In fact, the court has now been seeing this for now three or four months. Uh, which tells me that we'll have a decision in June. And maybe it'll be a decision on mootness, or maybe the court will look past the mootness issue and decide the Second Amendment question. Um, I would much rather have a live case involving concealed carry or the right to have a, a ban on certain types of ammunition. I think those cases are much more significant. This case, even if the plaintiffs win, is like, so what? Right? So, so what? You can carry a gun in a lockbox from New York to New Jersey. You know, okay, fine. That, that, that's a pretty minor issue. Okay? Um, but that's the first case I want to talk about, which involves uh, uh, the Second Amendment. Can I talk just to Please. Wayne? Oh, oh yeah, you know, let's go that. back and forth. Just, that's yeah, actually a better idea. Yeah, yeah let's uh, case case by case. give my breath a rest. Yeah, <laughs> that was pretty good. I didn't cough once. So I'm actually, happy. I think it's, uh, I think it's, um, uh, this was a super interesting case to listen to, the, to, listen to the oral argument about, um, because uh, as with uh, as with Jock, I was kind of wondering what this court was getting at. When it ignored letters, it there was a fascinating back and forth. The court wouldn't accept letters of mootness and so forth, and and you couldn't really figure out what was going on behind the scenes. I actually agree uh, that most <coughs> likely the city ordinance was unconstitutional. Um, I actually would have been fascinated to see if they took up the dormant commerce clause yes. came, claim because it was a fascinating dormant commerce clause claim based on the fact that. New York City could be seen as keeping all gun range revenue in New York City and denying it to other locales. Would love to have seen them go into that too, but because uh, I, I don't think the Second Amendment 
uh, issue is that interesting. It's so limited. It was such a ridiculous statute. Kind of, kind of agree with you there. Um, what what I found interesting was there's got to be, and this is purely <coughs> politics and supposition on my part, but there's got to be a real divide on the court right now because somebody's keeping this case alive. Yeah. Most people, after watching the oral argument, where the only justice who spoke up with any any real substance on the Second Amendment issue was Justice Alito. And otherwise, it was all about mootness. Um, and they did dance around. There were a few people who, you know, the the, uh, the argument of voluntary cessation, but the, the city made a pretty good case that they followed that rule, that it was a law, not just a will stop. It was a law that said, plus you had the, the New York State law that said the same thing basically striking down the restrictions so it looked pretty good on that point and then someone brought up the damages issue which by the way is fascinating because the federal government interceded in the in the um, case and said we actually don't agree with um, the rifle club that this is moot because of uh, that this uh, isn't moot because of the underlying but we'll make a damages mootness claim, that it's not moot because somebody could seek damages. And it's clear that the federal government does not want that doctrine out there, that they can't moot it by getting rid of the law. Um, I think the damages argument is just really, really weak. So the question for me is, why is this case still here? Yeah. And I just can't figure out for the life of me. This seems like an easy mootness decision. Nobody seems to want to take it up on its merits other than at least publicly Alito, and maybe there are others who kept quiet, but they kept pretty quiet. And I'm with Josh. It doesn't make much, doesn't plow much new ground. So, yeah. Uh, in, in any other context, this might be a different case where you have a government that for many years enforces an illegal policy, and, and then on the eve of Supreme Court review, the, 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 the local government tries to frustrate Supreme Court review. Right. If this involves, say, police brutality or illegal searches and seizures, you would have a very different optics, but because this is guns, I think this case goes, look, I mean, this could be an eight to one decision or a seven to two decision. Alito really wants a dissent. Well, all right, whatever. <laughs> we'll get a case next term, I don't know. Yeah, he might, yeah, you might have it like a, a mootness with a dissent from, you know, that. The court has an option, what's called a DIG, a D-I-G, dismissed as improvidently granted, where sometimes they'll accept the case and realize, uh-oh, we should have taken this, and they'll just get rid of it. And that leaves a little court decision stand. I read an awful lot of people who thought that would be the outcome. I it would happen within a dig. week. Yeah, I thought we'd dig right away, and now I backed off that prediction. We haven't seen anything. So I think this is an interesting one for Supreme Court politics, if not the actual law, underlying law. Yeah. Okay. All right. The second case that I want to talk about um, concerns DACA. And I need to give some history here. Um, in 2012, um, President Obama um, announced a policy known as DACA, a super deferred action for childhood arrivals. Um, what was DACA? DACA was a executive branch policy that deferred deportation of certain young immigrants who had come to this country uh, uh, under a certain age, uh, who were not here lawfully, and had really no prospect of gaining citizenship through family relations. Um, this policy did more than defer deportations. It also granted what's called lawful presence, which entitles them to various federal benefits. Um, there were no meaningful challenges to DACA in 2012. It was, it was a pretty popular policy. Now, I happen to think it was illegal, but I do think it's a good policy to have. Fast forward to 2015. I'm oh, sorry, no, 2014. Um, President Obama announced the second policy known as DAPA. DAPA, which stands for Deferred Action for Parents of Americans and Lawful Permanent Residents. This policy wasn't about the dreamers. It was about the parents of citizens, whether parents are not themselves citizens, as well as the parents of lawful permanent residents as green card holders. And this policy said, we're going to keep families together. If you're the parent of a citizen and you meet certain criteria, we will deprioritize your deportation and we'll also grant you lawful presence. These were not amnesty, as that term is often used. This did not grant citizenship to these individuals. Uh, some people may actually have gained citizenship, 
concert, but that wasn't the direct consequence. DAPA was far more popular because it wasn't for kids. These were for adults who came here volitionally. Uh, Texas Attorney General and, and a number of other states sued in 2014 challenging DAPA, and I filed amicus briefs in that case, and they're on their side. Um, and they argued that the DAPA policy was illegal. And the district court entered an injunction blocking DAPA, and the Fifth Circuit affirmed that injunction. And the case went to the Supreme Court, and it was granted, uh, cert was granted. However, while the case was pending, Justice Scalia passed away. So the court was down to eight. And at the end of the term, in 2016, the court affirmed four to four. When the court ties four to four, when the court ties four to four, he simply affirmed the lower court judgment without a decision. So the DAPA decision was affirmed but without any sort of Supreme Court analysis. Okay, fast forward to the election. Trump wins. Uh, he announces that he will suspend DAPA, which was not terribly disruptive because no one had it. Um, sometime later, Texas said, hey, what about DACA? And Texas said, if you don't rescind DACA, we're going to sue you and challenge it in federal court. Um, eventually, the Attorney General said, okay, we're going to wind down DACA. And uh, a, a memo was issued explaining the decision to wind down DACA. And the memo effectively said, we, we think this policy is illegal, and we uh, have a decision from the Fifth Circuit, and we think that the Fifth Circuit would likely rule against DACA as well. Again, the Fifth Circuit ruled on DAPA, which is similar to DACA. Um, and as a result, we're winding on DACA. It wasn't immediate, then. it was a six month wind down period, or 90 days, I can't remember the exact details, but it was a wind down period. Uh, the Trump administration was sued across the country. We had lawsuits in um, uh, uh, New York, in California, and you know, everywhere in between. Um, most of the judges who ruled agreed on something. They said that there's no doubt the president can with it, well, wind down DACA, right? He has the power to do that. But what most of these courts held was that the justification given was not adequate. That the rationale given was what we call in the lingo arbitrary and capricious. If you take admin law, you'll learn those words very well. Um, and here, here's a specific argument. Uh, the Trump administration said, we need to end this because it's illegal. Well, you're wrong. It's not illegal. We found that it's legal, and because the sole rationale you offered is legally correct, you've not offered a valid justification, therefore the cancellation memo, the rescission document, was itself null and void. And because the rescission document was null and void, DACA remains in effect as it was uh, announced by the Obama administration oh my God, nearly nine years ago, eight years ago. Okay? That was the argument. Uh, virtually every court, I think all the courts of appeals agreed, uh, no suit was brought in the Fifth Circuit. Well, actually, there, there is a suit in the Fifth Circuit brought by Texas, and that's been lingering forever. I think he's Judge, judge uh, 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 his face in Brownsville, uh, is just kind of waiting to see what happens. Um, what next? The Supreme Court granted cert. And there are a couple paths the Supreme Court can use. Um, one path is the court can simply say, uh, we don't have to decide if DACA is legal. All we have to decide is that the memorandum was sufficient and that we'll defer to the government. That is, we're not going to be so stringent on what arbitrary capricious is. Even if we may not agree with the government's rationale, it's a reasonable one to defer. That might be one path. Um, another path might be that the court says, we decide that DACA is illegal. And because DACA is illegal, the justification given was correct, and the policy can be wound down. Now, the difference between one and two is that if Trump loses re-election in uh, about a year or so, in theory, the next president could just reanimate DACA and just reinstitute it in its entirety. And then we'll be back where we started with Texas will challenge the court again. If the court chooses option number two and says that DACA is illegal, well, that ends it all together. Of course, there's a third option. The court can simply say, we agree DACA is lawful, um, and therefore the policy can withstand. Um, I'm skeptical of that result. Um, the, the 2016 decision was split four to four. I think there were four votes to say that DAPA was illegal. I think now there are five votes to say that DAPA is illegal. Um, so I think likely the court will either just say, we're not going to review this memo, it's not something to review, or the, 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 the memo is reasonable. But I think the court will ultimately say the president can wind down the policy. That will create a political blow up because the Trump policy has nothing to do with it. You know, what are you going to do for the, the DACA kids? So I think there will be a problem with that answer. Now, Professor Holland earlier 
mentioned the non-delegation doctrine, which I do want to talk about for a minute. We channeled it quite, quite, quite well. Uh, there's a very basic principle. You have three branches of government. You have the executive, you have the legislative, and the judicial. And each branch sort of manages their, their own affairs. But over the last, I don't know, 80 years, I think it's a good number, uh, uh, there's been a concern that the legislative branch might be delegating, might be giving too much power to the executive. And this, this mixture of the executive and legislative in one is problematic. Um, so there's this old doctrine called the non-delegation doctrine that says the, the legislature can't give broad legislative powers to the executive. Now under modern doctrine, it's pretty deferential, right? Let's say Congress enacts a statute that says the agency shall regulate the airwaves in the public interest. What the hell does that mean? Who could say what the public interest is? Or the agency shall enact reasonable regulations for public welfare. What, what, what does that mean? I don't really know. In other words, the blank check. And there are some people, like me, who think that that might go a bridge too far. That Congress needs to take more precise actions when delegating authority. So let's go back to the DACA case for a minute. Um, there's no statute that says the executive can do a deferred action. There's no statute that says that. Rather, there are statutes that say the executive, the attorney general, shall establish priorities in the immigration. That's, that's basically what it says. And the government has said, aha, establish priorities, that means that we can create documents, we'll deprioritize certain people, and oh, by the way, we can grant them deferred action status and grant them lawful presence and let them uh, do all these things allowed under federal law. Um, my argument is that these statutes you're relying on are broad and definitional, right? And if these statutes, which just talk about prioritization, give the power to enact the policy like DACA, then the INA itself has delegation problems, right? Congress would not quietly allow an agency to solve these major questions by these subtle delegations. So our position, and I wrote a brief for Cato, is that the court should read the statutes more narrowly. And some would say we should not presume that Congress lightly gives us much power quietly. To use Justice Scalia's memorable phrase, Congress does not hide, does not hide elephants in mouse holes, right? Not quietly. They do it bigly, if you might say that. <laughs> bigly, yeah. Got that one. Um, it seems a lot funnier when I'm not choking my, 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 my throat, right? Uh, I don't know that the court will use the rationale I'm given. Maybe I'll get maybe a, a concurring opinion, which might be nice. But I think I'm, what I'm trying to tease in this area is we should think carefully about these executive policies. Um, and you might like DACA, but the same sort of broad delegations that President Obama relied on, guess what? President Trump's relied on. My goodness. The emergency wall de uh, 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 the emergency declaration to build a wall, you know, there's statutes say that when the president declares an emergency, he can do a lot of things. Those statutes don't give any guidance. They don't give any criteria. It doesn't say how long the disaster will last for. Right? The travel ban case. The travel ban statute says the president can deny entry to people he finds detrimental. That's all it says. It doesn't say for how long he can do it. it doesn't say what detrimental has to mean. Right? Broad delegations are not just a conservative issue. I think there are statutes that affect all people and generally only care when the president you disagree with is in power. So I would like for the court to take delegations more seriously. Now, that doesn't mean you know, reversing the last 80 years of precedent, which I think is unlikely to happen, but at least say at the margins that we're going to require some of a something of a clear statement that Congress wants to give this much power to the executive branch. So, you want to add some comments about the DACA case? Yeah, um, so uh, going back to the, the basic sort of uh, structure of the DACA program, um, just real quickly, I do think there's a distinction here that uh, the court hasn't hasn't come down on yet. I think those uh, who are in favor of maintaining the DACA program cast it as a <coughs> as having two distinct steps. The first step is the decision, although it is a categorical decision, something that's happened before, of deferred pr prosecution. And most people don't have a problem with that. There is some talk about can it be given categorically, so forth and so on, but generally executive has the has the decisional power on deferred prosecution. The bigger issue is the granting of work authorization. 
And uh, I think that the two parties, just so you understand where it's coming from, I'm not saying there's no disagreement on deferred prosecution, there is some, but it's the joining of what they consider benefits of um, not being here illegally and therefore they can get work permits um, uh, and a few other benefits. So um, I think that's what the, the, when I, the, uh, the oral arguments really talked a lot about whether or not we could separate those two things out, one being the, the uh, deferred prosecution and the other being the, the gaining of benefits. I'm going to put that to one side and um, make a slightly, uh, I don't think this was an option Josh offered, it. correct me if I get this wrong, but I think there's another option for the court to take here. So um, the question at the heart of whether or not the court should hear this case, which was a major point of argument from the court, yeah. was whether or not the uh, rescission of uh, DACA was a uh, discretionary act that is immune from review by the courts, right? Um, a discretionary act of the executive under separation of powers, the courts would not get involved. Um, and uh, the argument there is that the memo that was released by the then secretary, the contemporaneous memo, uh, there's a contemporaneous memo and then a second memo by Secretary Nielsen. Um, the contemporaneous memo uh, talked almost exclusively about the belief that the law was uh, illegal. It was unconstitutional, an unconstitutional act by the president, uh, President Obama. And therefore, they would rescind it. There was at least one sentence, maybe a couple, on some of the other considerations to weigh. But the argument is basically that the, that the Trump administration, based on its decision to rescind DACA, on its perception that it was uh, an unconstitutional act. Okay? The thing that, the, the next step of that argument is, if you rescinded it because it's unconstitutional, that's not a discretionary act. Right? If it's a legal basis, then it's not a discretionary act. So if it's not a discretionary act, then the court can review it for illegality and potentially it can be sent back to the department or the court, the lower courts for reconsideration on that issue. <coughs> it's catching apparently. <coughs> Sorry. So um, I think there's a possibility of another, another path that they say the court says, this isn't discretionary, this comes down to an illegality, and we're either going to give the administration another pass at this where they start over, or uh, we're going to, and I think that's probably the most likely one, so I'll stop there. I think that they'll, we'll give it another pass um, and punt on the legality itself, determining the legality. Can they do that? Yes. Should they do that? Probably not, but they can. Yeah. So from my understanding, they do have to start from the, from, in order for the court to determine the legality of the act itself, of, of, of DACA and the rescission, right? In order to do that, they must start from the proposition that the decision to rescind was not discretionary. And the way that they would get there is to say, not that the act is or is not legal, but rather that, the, that the, the primary or only reason that the Trump administration made this decision was based on its perception that it was illegal, 
right? And that might be an erroneous perception. That might be an erroneous perception, and therefore, that is reviewable. We're going to give them, and then it's all about the remedy. And therefore, we're going to consider Man. the legality, or therefore, we're going to send it back to the Trump administration, or we're going to send it back to the lower courts for more of a record. Any of those are a possibility, in my view. Let me, let me just caveat. Again, reviewability is something that cuts both ways. Um, mm -hmm. If the court gives a very stingy opinion about reviewability, and you know, that means the next Trump policy might be more easily upheld, right? Uh, generally, state attorneys general don't like reviewability doctrine; it's too stringent, right? They want to be able to go to court, whether it's President Bernie Sanders, or President Elizabeth Warren, or President whoever, whoever you want. If reviewability becomes more stringent, that's harder to get review of these documents then that makes it harder for civil rights litigants in general and, and, and advocacy groups to, to move forward. So these are, again, like severability, this is not only a right-left issue. These are issues that linger, which is why I think the court won't review, won't, won't punt on reviewability because that, that, that could potentially mess things up for later. You might be right. I think it depends on <coughs> how much of what the court does is driven by what they want to address and what they don't want to address, right? And sometimes they're searching for the loophole. Um, as to the non-delegation thing, I hope uh, I'd invite you to explain that a little more because I find it fascinating because I do agree with you it cuts both ways, right? And I would say uh, uh, what we've seen, particularly through the last three presidents to a later, up a greater or lesser extent, is a, is a, uh, a vast expansion of, of perceived executive power, not only uh, taking the power, but the court's refusal and Congress's refusal to get involved in executive power. And I do think that the non-delegation doctrine offers some relief on the expansion of, of executive power. My issue is, could you offer a few comments on what you see as the limiting principle I there? Yeah, I know. Yeah. It's the killer, right? right. It's the it's killer hard. question. It, yeah. It's hard. And... Um, one of the reasons why courts are skeptical about policing delegations is how do you know where to stop, right? As a general matter, Congress is lazy. They don't like doing hard work, and they don't like taking difficult votes. because They can be judged for it. It's much easier for Congress to pass a broad statute, give all the authority to the executive, and then maybe later, through oversight, nibble at the edges to try to make sure they're doing the right thing. Um, I don't know at the margin, the marginal case by delegation. But in the DACA case, as well as the other cases I want to mention, I think there's a pretty good argument that when Congress enacted these immigration laws, they did not intend to give the power to, to DACA. How do I know this? DACA has been considered in Congress for almost 20 years. It's never gotten a majority. These are immigration laws passed decades ago. I think it goes beyond any conceivable scope of authority that was intended to be delegated. Um, uh, when you have a statute that only says the Secretary can prioritize immigration law, that, that that can't mean DACA, because if that means DACA, then we have this major legislative debate for nothing. So, it's, are you making any distinction there about the deferred prosecution versus second, the granting second. of benefits? Uh, here's the example I use. If President Obama basically gave people saying, we will not deport you in a car that said nothing but that, I don't think I'd be making this argument. I think the President has a lot of authority over prosecutorial discretion. In fact, I had a piece in the Washington Post this morning on whether President Trump can intervene in the sentencing of Roger Stone. And I said, he can, because the President has discretion. I don't think that comes from Congress. In fact, I don't think Congress could enact a statute telling the President to deport individual people. I don't think the President can enact a statute telling him to prosecute specific people. I think that belongs to the President. There are lots of statutes that delegate authority about prosecutions. I think those are merely confirming what's already there. I think that's a power the executive has. So if we're only talking about do not deport, I would not be filing a brief the way I did. My objection is that it didn't just grant the do not deport status, but it granted the lawful presence, which comes a lot of the benefits. And I'll give you another data point. The current regulations concerning lawful presence were enacted in the 1980s. Um, and when they were being considered, uh, a member of the administration came to Congress, and someone asked him, you know, how many people do you think will be getting this uh, a work authorization? And he said, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, the number is so small it's not even worth counting. Right? This was meant as like a gap filler for certain people who fell in a, in a very small category where they needed some help for a limited period. DACA could apply to a million people, and it's renewable. It could last basically indefinitely. This granting of benefits is so far beyond the scope of what Congress had delegated, um, I, I don't think it's permissible. 
another question. Sorry, it's related somewhat to this. So one of the, the odd things about DACA, your, if, if I understand your principle consistently, neither DACA itself nor the rescission <coughs> would, I guess, while maybe taking away benefits, we'd have to argue about that. But basically, you would say both should just be wiped off the table. You don't need the second one if you already have the first one. So if, if that's the case, <coughs> um, well, I guess, I guess I'm wondering. Not quite sure how to put this. Just do it. No, no, no. It's no, no. It's not political. It's 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 uh. Let me it's, just do it. I it's lack of intelligence. Don't check my mentions uh, today. Um. Uh, uh. If that's the case, if we got rid of both. Uh, what do you do about the people who have relied on executive orders? And I think this is a bigger question than just immigration. Deferred prosecution at some point is there a, for lack of a better, estoppel. a latches or estoppel argument yeah. about lack of prosecution? I, I take that argument very seriously, and it's actually in several regards. So one regard is sharing information. For people to you know, apply for DACA, that's put forward a lot of information, right? And the idea was to put this information yeah. forward, it will not be used against you. Well, you've just basically confessed to being here illegally. That can now be used for your removal. Right? You, you've confessed. You, you admitted in, in, in sworn statements, right? And here are all my family members and where they live, right? Here are my references. So there's some argument that the information um, given maybe can't be used against them. I think there might be a decent due process argument there. Um, another component is uh, can you rescind benefits that people come to rely on? Uh, the DACA policy itself was very clear. It said this can be rescinded at any time. Yeah. I don't know if there's like a due process detrimental reliance argument. I'm sure that had a phrase. That's, that's I get what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like, a, like a, dis, a detrimental reliance or an estoppel argument. Um, if the policy is illegal, I don't know that the courts have the power to continue as continued enforcement. Uh, let, me, let me phrase that a little differently. If this is illegal, how can a court order the executive to maintain an illegal policy? Where would that authority right. come from? Uh, I think there might be a wind down period. Um, I think you can even have that. Think of like the school desegregation cases. You integrate with all deliberate speed, right? So it's not integrate right away, but get to it eventually. But I don't know that you can maintain a legal policy indefinitely. At a minimum, I think what will happen is people have it, will keep it for their two or three years, whatever's remaining, they can't renew it. I think I think, I think think that, and then when it winds down, then it'll be gone. What about deferred, pure deference of prosecution? For instance, the, the current uh, marijuana approach that the, right, that the DOJ takes, and so forth, where you built up entire industries based on this deferred look. Look, I mean, I when you that's a mess. Th 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 this is this is an argument that I take quite seriously. When you build your life on an executive action, you're building your life in a house of sand. Yeah. Right. Every four years, executive policy changes. If you're going to invest in a marijuana industry, and you have a president Trump coming, you might rescind that. Uh, you're, you're in a risky position. That's why you need legislation. I support the DACA Dream Act. I support the legislation. I think if DACA is declared unlawful by the courts, there's going to have to be some sort of legislative compromise, right? Dreamers for the wall. I don't know. You can, you can make it up. <laughs> but I think you're going to have to do something because you have millions of people. Look, states allow DACA recipients to apply for licenses to the bar. They can sit for the bar exam, right? They, 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 they can uh, be admitted to the medical profession. Uh, it's very disruptive that we say, okay, now you're unemployed. You can't work anymore. Um, Obama got away with one, right? He, he won, right? He did something I think was illegal, but he got through. And even if the court stops it now, I think his action will survive. He did this initially thinking that he would eventually get a statute through. He didn't realize how politics would turn against immigration. He didn't quite anticipate that at the time. He thought this was a stopgap measure until legislation passes after he gains more seats in Congress. That's what he expected would happen. He was wrong. That didn't happen. There's that, big that, that was it. Oh, <laughs> well, yeah, but politicians are often wrong. They don't anticipate things. But that's what he anticipated would happen. It was a stopgap measure that's here nine years later. Yeah. I mean, just to quit the last thing on this, just to, on the uh, marijuana thing, I think if not for the, uh, in, the the Mueller investigation and Sessions' decision to recuse himself, we probably would have had a rollback of that. I mean, his stated goal of Attorney General Sessions was to stop, was to go back to prosecuting the marijuana cases at a federal level. So, which hunts? Which, if not for his response to him getting fired for, for the Mueller thing, I think that's where we would have ended up. Well, 
Okay, I know you have one more case you want to. Oh boy, we only have a few minutes left. We've done it one. Let's just let's just skip the third case. Go to Q and A. All right, we can cool. skip the little sisters there. If you want to ask Matt the little sisters? Yeah, right here. I have uh, two questions for not uh, New York Right One Please. Association. First, as for the oral arguments when they got into the topic of the new ordinance with the continuous and uninterrupted travel with the hand mm -hmm. Yes. Is that something the court can still? Okay. From, uh, let, let me just. That yeah. Not, yeah. Okay. And what's your second question? And the second question is also assuming that it's not moved. Would that have been an opportunity, and maybe that's why they've tried to keep it around, or someone in the court has tried to keep it around, to instruct uh, strict scrutiny onto the second round rather than this intermediate scrutiny that it seems the majority of the courts of appeals have tied to the Second Amendment when that's clearly not the norm for any of the Bill of Rights, say, in the first one. Okay, let, let me answer both your questions. So the law that New York enacted, they said that, yes, you can transport your gun to a shooting range inside the state. What if you stop for gas in the way? What if you stop for a cup of coffee? Coffee is the big one. What if you stop to go to coffee? Is the what if you go to stop and visit your mother in Weehawken, right, in Jersey, right? How long of a stop makes it that you're no longer continuously moving? And this is not a trivial issue. Um, in Texas, you don't have to worry about this, but in certain northeastern states, when you drive from one state to another, you don't stop, right? When I moved from Virginia to Pennsylvania, I did not stop in Maryland, right? I have a carry permit that, wor that worked in Virginia and a carry permit that worked in Pennsylvania. I did not have one from Maryland. I did not stop for gas. I, didn't, I had a U-Haul, huge truck. I kept going. Did not even drive through D.C. Didn't want to risk it. I took it halfway around. Because if you stop for any period of time, for whatever reason a police officer detains you, hello, unlawful possession of a firearm. Go to jail. Nice, good luck, right? So this, this, this coffee issue is not trivial. It's something that gun owners are familiar with and very much aware with. I don't think the court's going to take it. Now I'll ask for strict scrutiny. Let me just respond oh, to please, that real please. quick. Yeah. At oral argument, what the city of New York said was that even it a, we're not going to get you for a cup of coffee, but what they, they also claimed was that the New York statute doesn't contain that limitation, and that the New York statute, which is passed after the repeal, therefore controls. So I think they got around it from mootness <coughs> by doing that. Yeah, so sorry. That's all fine on the microphone. Uh, the second point is on strict scrutiny. Look, in the 2008 case of Heller, um, the court was asked, should we apply strict scrutiny? Um, the DOJ, the Justice Department, Paul Clement, argued, no, don't do strict scrutiny. Now Paul Clement, in private practice, saying strict scrutiny, right? Everyone, everyone's, everyone's all over the place. I don't think the court will do that. I think Roberts was very skeptical of strict scrutiny. Because if you actually apply strict scrutiny to most gun laws that are unconstitutional, most gun laws are irrational, right? You'll probably disagree with this. But most gun laws are designed to make people feel better. They actually don't say anything, right? I do. Right? Right? The entire concept of an assault weapon is a myth, right? These are just guns that look scary, right? It's irrational, right? If you apply any meaningful scrutiny, most gun laws don't make any sense. They make people feel better. Um, but that, uh, the court said that making people feel better is a rational basis, and it's an intermediate scrutiny basis. So I don't think the court will give you strict scrutiny, unfortunately. So I think at the margins, this won't change much. I think, I, I tend to agree they're not going to go to strict scrutiny, and they'll keep the intermediate. I would disagree. They do do this weird thing where they avoid strict scrutiny and don't say they're applying a mu uh, intermediate, and they do that in a lot of cases. It's just dressed up differently. So putting that aside, I think the more interesting or the more direct question in front of the court is this distinction between is there a higher level of scrutiny where you're talking about a right that is in the text, which is this argument that's coming out of, you saw Scalia do it in the Fourth Amendment context. Uh, with uh, Jones, a similar thing of objects that are in the text of the amendment receive a greater <coughs> protection than, object, than things that are not. And I think there's an argument out there that this is literally bare, and therefore we should adopt higher scrutiny. I did not see the votes on the court. No, I agree with yeah, no, that. Maybe, maybe a question from someone else? Yeah. 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 Kavanaugh, yeah. definitely. Yes, maybe, maybe another question before we get out of here? No, once. Are you, quick question. Are you familiar with Espinosa v. Garland? 
Yes, I'd be happy to talk about it after. It would be fantastic. We don't have time. I think we're going to kick that. All right, guys. Thanks for coming out. Thank you uh, all so like much. Said, I'm glad you survived. Please come to the happy hour on Thursday. Is it, it my class in here, Vix? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, nice. what am I rushing? Yeah, you guys can keep talking.